psychiatric social worker and I own a company called Amps and Sound. Uh, and we're gonna talk about basic amplifier topology today. Um, and some things that I think are worth knowing. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, I'm quadruply vaccinated, by the way. And I had a recent COVID test on Saturday because my daughter had a cold and I wanted to make sure that I got no one sick. So I got enough vaccine for everybody. And I got proof that I don't have COVID. So How do you get it more than once? You ask nicely. <laughs> if you hold your hand up and tell people that you want to be vaccinated, no one asked me if I've been vaccinated before. Yeah. I also am a frontline health worker in an emergency room where I see people coming in with COVID all day long. Um, and so it put the fear of God in me. And since I was first vaccinated in December, six months after my Pfizer vaccine, my titer levels were, had already dropped and I knew it. And so I got vaccinated again. So. All right, back to uh, things that are heavy and don't drop them, please. So this amp is a little odd in, in, it, in its uh, weight distribution. I'd love to pass these around so people can kind of see examples. Uh, if you just pass it to the next person, it'd be kind of awesome so everybody can touch, feel, scratch, and sniff. Um, uh, and just try not to drop them if you could, please. All right. So here are some interesting examples in my mind. So you have Schitt's Magni, which is like everybody's gateway drug. <laughs> uh, if there was ever a good starting point, I think that this is a really good, awesome starting point. Excuse me, and it's the heresy version. Did you say Magni? Yes. That looks different. It's the heresy version. Oh. So its topology is a little different. So I'm going to pass this one here. And these used to be able to get as kits. They still do them as kits. They're called a CMOS amplifier. Uh, you can get them on Amazon and hand to your friends. They're super cool. Um, you can trace out the circuit with a piece of paper, understand it. Uh, it uses an op amp, and you can roll op amps. So op amps have sonic differences, and you can hear them. Even though, in theory, they shouldn't, and they don't, they do. And I would encourage people to, to get one of these and try it. And at a very basic level, you can see you know, what is a cap, what is a resistor, what's an op amp. How does this circuit function? It's a really simple, basic example. What's the power supply? It's a DC 9 volt battery, right? And you can begin to understand in the microcosm uh, what subtle changes do to sonic preferences. So, is this thing off that? Yep. All right. So, uh, one of the first questions that always gets asked, um, and my focus on this discussion is going to be sort of principled ideas that guide what I try to help people think about when they make selections on buying equipment. So uh, I have a pretty long track record as a hobbyist, which means that I've broken a lot of things <laughs> and tried to fix a lot of things. And in so doing, I created a company because I have a great team of people who work with me, share my vision. And for the better part of a decade, we went about changing one thing at a time with our circuits and really understanding what that imparted and changed and what we wanted to do about it. So that sort of methodology was important. Okay, so um, tubes versus solid state tends to be a defining question for people. And you know, one thing that you could think about is tubes came first, right? Oh, I'm sorry, can, can you guys hear me or am I not talking loudly enough? I can talk louder if, okay, cool. Okay. Awesome. So tubes are an old, antiquated, decrepit technology. <laughs> this is coming from the guy that, if you guys want to pass that one around, it will drop on you, though. It weighs 40 or 50 pounds. <laughs> um, this is my example of an amp we built. Um, is it easier to put it on the center of the floor for people, or do you guys want me to put it on a table? Table. Cool. Happily. So... Why, why tubes versus solid state is a question of sonic preferences. It's is also much a question of what you listen to and why you listen to it, how you listen to music. So I am not one for analysis. Analysis is another part of my life where I tend to. Okay, I need it for the back of the room. I'm sorry. Sure. So. 
I am not one for analysis. Analysis really is a different part of my life. Music is an emotive, uh, transformative experience that is meant to take me away from the things that I have to concentrate on. Now, as an audiophile, I got asked the question, what does it mean to be an audiophile? And I thought my answer and the answer of the people who came behind me were really important, which is that being an audiophile is to attend to what we listen to purposefully, that it captures our attention. It's very rare that we can do it like passively. So on one hand, I'm saying, you know, I pay attention to the quality of what I listen to for sure, but I try not to dissect it. That is the consciously dissect it. I, I dissect it with more of the emotive version of myself. That's not everybody. I know this wholeheartedly that that's not everybody. Some people really like to observe. Uh, you know, so it, if we look at artwork, some people enjoy the understanding of the brush stroke or the composition or the balance or the tonality of the painting in front of them. Uh, the technical aspects capture their attention. Um, I look at the shades in the composition more than I look at the technical aspects. The same to be said for audio. So knowing in general, and you could be part of, this isn't sort of like picking Gryffindor uh, <laughs> versus Sl Slytherin, Team Slytherin. Um, you know, um, you can be many things, but thinking about what motivates you or what you pay attention to should help inform what you want to buy and invest in. Right, so tubes, color sound. There's no way to say they don't. Tubes produce distortion. Anybody tell you so the tube amp doesn't produce distortion is um, not giving the most accurate portrayal of it from my perspective. But that's not the point. The point is that the distortion that tube amps produce is characterologically different than solid state amps. Uh, and more akin with what we as humans perceive as natural hearing that it happens within our environment. So if you want something, if you believe that, that line of thinking, tube amps sound more like natural reproduction, therefore you're more drawn to it. Now there are things that solid state amps do that tube amps can't do. Uh, solid state amps have a rise time, their slew rate can be much faster. Uh, their rise time on an oscilloscope can be much faster. Uh, their ability to produce a square wave is un undoubtedly more, more uh, uh, better achieved than a, a tube amp uh, without like filters and stuff. I, being a tube amp builder that doesn't believe in like feedback as a general rule, you know, so I'm like Italian cooking as, as few ingredients as possible. They just all have to matter in what, in what order you put them in. Um, so. If you are a person that believes that uh, I want fast transients, I want absolute uh, dead silence. The silence where if you've turned off the circuit breaker in your house, the silence in the room, silence. Um, I want uh, to hear the attack in a way that is hyper real. So if you like EDM, techno, things that have an 808 in it, in, it, in its production, you might be more drawn to a solid state ch choice and amplification. If you like tremolo, tonality, the sustain, so sustain versus attack is like, and Grover, if he's still here, will tell you it better than I, because he explained the mechanics of sound production better than I, for sure, is you know how fast that cymbal hits that initial snap, solid states do it better how long it reverberates and then the texture or quality of the reverberation is a better captured uh, through a tube amp. So these are sort of guiding ideas like which one would I want and why, right? Okay, so uh, other things to be considered solid state amps almost always have more power depending on you know whether it's a MOSFET, op amp, uh, you know JFETs, Whatever specific technology a uh, solid state amp might employ, it's almost always going to produce more power than a tube amp. Um, in personal audio, I don't think that power is always the guiding principle. So, um, again, we're saying you know solid state amps are more dynamic, 
and they have more power, right? Now, I got into personal audio because I used to build horn-loaded speakers that were hyper-efficient. And so a horn-loaded speaker that can be 160 dB efficient behaves very similarly to a headphone that's 94 to 108 dB efficient. The amps have to be really quiet. They have to have really good bandwidth. Um, and horns can cut your ear apart just as quickly as good headphones. You know, high SPL or headphones that headphones or sources, um, if not paired correctly, can produce a lot of sibilance or strain our ears. And so the same idea is that if you don't watch that carefully, it's going to hurt you. Uh, is what brought me into headphones. So, just as a, a thought, so tube amps generally more more natural and more and less listener fatigue. So why is that about the less listener fatigue? The general guiding principle is this, we roll it off. What I mean by roll it off is if you drew a straight line, right, like a studio monitor in theory, we might say is it's ruler flat or with, within, nothing's ruler flat, but it's more ruler flat. Where tube amps on the low frequencies and on the high frequencies, we roll it off between three and six dB depending on, on what you're doing. Now, good transformers, good circuits, good implementations make that roll off less so. It still occurs. That's not a bad thing. That's just understand the topology, understand what it's doing, but it protects our ears too. Uh, female listeners uh, have way better high frequency hearing and spatial properties in general than male listeners because we've damaged our hearing and our hearing deteriorates with age. It's generally true. Take a hearing test to prove us wrong on the issue. Um, and so, like my wife, will take great issue when I'm tuning a speaker, and I have her listen to the headphones as well. Um, she picks up on high frequency energy and spatial awareness at it with a higher degree of sensitivity than I do. And I generally like my music more colored darkly because uh, things that are incisive, uh, things that are technically rich, um, which is, can be a preference for a lot of people, unfortunately, is hard for us to listen to for two hours. Um, a, I, maybe it's the you know adult ADHD. It's not, but uh, you know if I can't listen to two albums in a sitting because I have fatigue in my ear, something's wrong. Tube amps with their natural behavior protect us from that, as a general rule. So just something to be considered. Um, OTL output transformless designs versus transformer coupled designs. Why? As a general rule. So. Transformer couple designs. Uh, an oversimplification would be, you know, sort of Mongo likes bigger meat. You know, like it's bigger, bigger, uh, bigger output transformers. From my perspective, yield better sound because uh, you are. These are twenty watt output transformers for an amp that's putting out at most six watts. Now, I own the IP on the transformers, and I'm having them made by multiple suppliers. Multiple suppliers tell me that this is a 60 watt output transformer in their world, and they say, no, it's not, and stop saying that, please. It's a 20 watt output transformer to me, and leave me alone. The ability to generate secondary distortion, because I mean, all transformers talk, all transformers vibrate. They just do. You Anybody who tells you otherwise, you may not feel it, but it's doing it because it's generating a magnetic field through a coil and it's surrounded by steel laminations. They move. If you put enough current through them, they talk. If you play low enough frequencies from them, they will move. Even Macintoshes will do this. I'll put them on a scope and measure them. Bigger transformers are less, and, and when presented with smaller input amounts, six watts at the most, are much, much less likely to generate mechanical distortion because I can't, I can't get them angry enough. So bigger transformers are a better idea when it's a transformer coupled design. The downside of that is you have this thing called insertion loss, which means it takes a little bit of push to get it going. So like I have a VPI turntable, it likes a bump to get moving because the platter's 20 pounds, right? If I didn't give it a bump, 
the cape, the, the belt slips a little and chirps, right? So I lose a little bit of power by using big transformers, and I'm okay with that. Um, there are two schools of thought when it comes to headphones from my perspective. One is that there are headphones that are extremely efficient. I would say the majority of headphone manufacturers are moving to ever more efficient designs uh, that utilize more and more uh, rare metallurgy to make the behavior of the cone more pistonic. You know? um, and then there are ones that like power. Right? Um, even the ones that like power, six watts is a lot of power. Six watts that you can turn to at all times is, is, a, is just an enormous amount of power. And your eardrum can't handle it, by the way. You're going to pop your eardrum or damage your hearing if you're playing it that loud. Just are. It's, it, it's the truth. Most people need an amp that produces between 100 milliwatts and 250 milliwatts. So just know for like, 90% of all headphones out there, if it's producing about a quarter watt of power, that's probably all you need. Now, what about headroom? Why do I have so much power? Well, people choose headphones that are, have a wide variety of choices. So we have some, we have Dan Clark's at our table, Stealth, it likes power. Uh, the LCD5, you know, I believe will like power, I haven't gotten to hear it yet. The Abysses love power, right? The LCD4s love power. Just slam it with as much power as you can give it. And then we have the Verite Closed, which, you know, I could take my fingers and, and light it up with just the friction from my fingers. It's a hyper-efficient headphone, thank goodness. Um, so these are like the two polarities. When you talk about sort of like choosing amplification, some axioms to think about that are really helpful, at least from my perspective as a tube amp builder. As power goes up, noise goes up, always. So if you need a bigger gun, understand you're choosing a bigger gun that's gonna have a higher noise floor. So if just um, same with like a hyper-powerful engine, right? It's gonna consume more fuel, it's gonna make more exhaust, but nothing's free. Physics will tell us nothing is free, right? Um, and that's okay, so back to the point of just choosing what you need as being you know, finding that, that middle ground to things. Um, a two times multiplier tends to be a really good choice for most people, at least getting into selections. So if I said, hey Justin, uh, a, a quarter of a watt, 250 milliwatts is all I need, you told me. Double that and you have good dynamic range. So a half watt amp for most intensive purposes, especially for tube amps, is a lot of power, a lot of power. Um, that you will probably never need because you'll pop your ears before you consume before the headphone consumes that much power. All right, so I'm digressing. I apologize. I will try to get to most of the stuff in the syllabus as quickly as possible. But output transformerless designs versus transformer coupled output transformerless designs have a lower cost of entry from a parts selection standpoint. They are really thoughtful in that they let the two engage the full uh, bandwidth it's capable of. So uh, they have much more dynamic range to them, you know, wider bandwidth, I should say, to them. Um, execution matters a great deal with output transformerless designs. They tend to be somewhat limited in their impedance. So most tube amps uh, don't care what impedance headphones you present to them as long as you don't short them out and go to the ground. So as long as you don't give them like a zero ohm headphone, they will tolerate being plugged in. Solid state amps, not always so much, much more sensitive to that truth be told. And uh, output transformless designs don't like it either. So um, to do a little proselytization, uh, this is a bottle head crack. It's famous, like 30 years famous. Uh, and this is actually one of our friends, and he made it, and he's super proud of it and loves it. It, when I grab it, it's a fairly simple design. There are no diodes here. So there's nothing that, you know, this could have been made for all intents and purposes in the 1930s, before silicon. 
And it was. I mean, there were designs like this in the 1930s using more rare tubes at this point, but they existed. Um, I like this version for most hobbyists or people getting into to higher end choices because this is about a $350 amp that you build yourself. So the, all the labor is you. I like this version because it doesn't have what's called the speedball uh, upgrade, right? So uh, I appreciate a company that can make a drug, drug using joke <laughs> of a crack with a speedball. Um, but speedballs use JFETs, if I remember correctly, JFETs, right? Um, they add silicon. So you take this really old school traditional choice, which is so amazing, and to make it behave better and more linear and less tube-like, we add solid state. So if you ever get a chance to build one, love it for its original vision. Don't add the, don't add the speedball. Yes, maybe it's better in absolute technical terms, but there's no circuit board here. This is really old school, super cool technology. Um, if you are an SBAF fan or you know, in line with the school of thought, this and an HD 600 is a lot of people's idea of like end game. That is a good, solid, fantastically good choice, right? So it's impedance, it is impedance sensitive though. So if you give it a 32 ohm impedance, it's okay. 100 ohm impedance headphone, it's better. 250, 300, it's happy. Anything lower than 32 ohms, anything that's a little harder to drive, it's less happy. And, it, and you will hear it. Um, its sound stage will compress and fall apart, and that's no fun. So why, why transformers back to that millennia? Think of them like torque converters, car analogy again. It's a torque multiplying device, right? So it's converting DC into AC. Um, be, it's so much black magic and artistry and engineering goes into transformers. Uh, America, unfortunately, is losing transformer companies uh, weekly. Uh, I lament this because it's, it's a problem I have to manage and work through. Um, but transformers represent uh, one of the most enduring aspects of audio reproduction. So you can buy something that is 40 years old that might feel worthless, put capacitors in it, and breathe it back to life because it's transformers didn't age. Transformers are really hard to damage. Short of put, shorting them out, like I said, or putting them in water, uh, they're nearly indestructible. By the way, if you guys want the little analogy, if any people know my company well enough, uh, I used to produce an amp called the Mogwai, mm -hmm. which is a gremlin, right? You get a Mogwai wet, it becomes a gremlin, much like a tube amp. <laughs> Super cute, beautiful things. Don't get them wet. Bad idea. Total, total boogers. So that's where the Mogwai came from. Okay, uh, let's see. Transform, transformer couple designs prevent DC from reaching the voice coil. It increases cost, weight. Um, again, transformers can, uh, like a good torque converter, I'm using car analogies, I apologize, but a good torque converter can take the power that an engine produces and couple it to the tires more effectively, right? And that's, again, what you would think of as a transformer for headphones. Good transformers matter. So when you're looking at transformer designs, you wanna see bigger transformers, not smaller. You want someone to tell you that they're special um, because, again, they should outlive you or me. I'm 42, my amps, God willing, are gonna outlive me. You know, that, that's their goal. You know, that or me writing a book or lecturing is you know, how, how you live on into perpetuity. Um, but they impart uh, a sonic, how well they, how, how wide bandwidth they are, uh, how well they transfer current uh, affects our tonal perception of things. So you want a really high quality transformer because it looking pretty means it's visually appealing, but not necessarily that's going to yield sonic dividends. So investing in the quality of the transformers from my perspective is super important. So from my school of thought, I think most headphones, there are exceptions, 
don't do spatial perception well. They just don't. By set of speakers, you'll see speakers um, give more spatial information because they're further from our ear and they can convey distance more, more tangibly. But what headphones give us is intimacy, from my perspective. Um, so good transformer designs can, you know, what I endeavor to is that I'm 10 to 12 feet from the performer. If I can feel them spit, it's a good thing. You know, and I had somebody give me a really good compliment. They had listened to one of my amplifiers in a set of uh, high Feynman HE1000 SCs, and it's like, it's the microphone. And I thought that that was the, the greatest compliment because it was like, you're there, the weight is there. Because if you're talking about an intimate performance, how far we are from the, from the performer matters. Do you want to feel that performer? Right, and there are designs that will do that. So in solid state, you know, how little feedback is applied to that circuit may affect that. How, much, how big the power supply might affect that with solid state choices. What coupling caps are being used might affect that, right? So again though, you wanna kind of, you know, what kind of listener am I? And what designs are gonna to lend to that listening experience? Okay, um, caps versus interstage transformers, I, I, I added some things. Um, <coughs> the, everybody know the company Western Electric or I've heard the company Western Electric? Okay, it is everybody's idea of some secret sauce, Heinz recipe, it, 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 you know, Henry Ford, quintessential, Hershey's chocolate, quintessential, when we think audio, it's our holy grail is Western Electric designs. Um, and there are designs from Western Electric, they, they were some insanely smart people, uh, that had like zero capacitors in it. It would be like three, three tubes and an interstage transformer and an output transformer, and that was it. There wasn't a capacitor to be found. Now, I would argue that capacitors in, in, in audio are an advent of the 60s, the way silicon is. Because if you look at tube amps in the 60s, which were the only thing, you know, up until mid-60s, we didn't have uh, solid state devices. You didn't have diodes, you didn't have MOSFETs, you didn't have transistors, you know, TO3s, if everybody remembers TO3s. Um, with modern material science, i.e. NASA, the space race, the modernization of the American economy, we didn't have cap capacitor production that was smaller and improved, right? And so amplifiers used more iron, chokes, interstage transformers uh, because we didn't have good metallurgy or good uh, modern production of capacitors. As that occurred, principally because again the space race and the, and the raw science that came from the space race and the uh, build out of um, industrial uh, production Right, you see uh, amps in the 90s start getting huge capacitor supplies to them. Uh, that happened in Chu Channel and it's, it bled into personal audio, right? Because now capacitors are smaller and we don't need as many transformers. Now, an interstage transformer can do what a coupling capacitor can do. Um, and again, it's back to this transformer question can you get a good one? Short answer is probably not. Um, you like you can't get a good one as a production-oriented company like myself in volume without. Um, I've sent people to seize chocolate before when I when I put in transformer orders. I send up <coughs> two pounds of seized chocolate to the office and I make friends first, um, and then I talk about what I need. Um, I have found that being kind and considerate gets me further because it is not even a question of money. It is a question of personal relationships. Transformers are extremely difficult to get done at a small scale like I am and get done at a high degree of specialization. Interstage transformers make normal transformers look like basic arithmetic versus, you know, trigonometric or advanced algebra. They're just 
they're, they're more complicated voltage transfer devices. So let's just assume in this argument, you guys aren't gonna encounter it. Um, Donald North uses some interstage transformers. Uh, Eddie Kern uh, did use some interstage transformers, but it's a, it's a boutique idea. You're gonna find that it's more coupling caps that are put into sort of uh, uh, audio designs. Okay, so capacitors. Again, capacitors store energy, how they're used. Uh, you know, when you're buying an amp, why am I buying an amp? This, you know, why should someone spend more money on coupling capacitors? One question. Or uh, what, why do I care about the power supply? So in a solid state amp, you can, even in a tube amp too, there are companies that do this, you can get what's called a switched mode power supply, uh, which are hyper efficient, really small, probably not repairable. They're replaceable, but they're not repairable generally. Um, and they inject a, an awful lot of noise into audio circuits, and so you have to put in blocking elements to stop their, their, their production of energy or the transfer of energy from your wall into the power supply generates noise, and so they have to filter that noise out. Why do you use them? Because UL and the EU have efficiency requirements. So it's really hard to get a tube amp into the European Union because it has to have like a stand, standby button and if it's not being used for X period of time, you have to have a microprocessor that'll turn it off. These designs do not do that. Uh, I pride myself on, you know, like no silicon, no microprocessors, you know, how we built it in the 50s and 60s is how I'm trying to do it now with modern material science. So I have higher tolerance parts, but the old way. So switch mode power supplies um, are really inexpensive. Like for a company by in volume, like they could be as little as like three dollars. So in a low end consumer product, it is helpful because you can meet the power requirements you need. They're super small, they're compact, they're super efficient. They're also not super great, right? So you want to look at um, amps that have linear power supplies. So a good example. And the, so the Shit Magni, does anybody own a Magni yet? Okay. The Shit Magni's stupidly awesome. They give you a linear power supply right here. This thing's monster. It, you know, weighs more than the amp itself. <laughs> As it should. Right? And shit to their credit, when they built um, does anybody have one of their bigger headphone amps? Which what do you have? I got the original linears. Okay. They have a linear power supply. They have a transformer plus some capacitors uh, in their headphone amp. That's a that solid execution. Right? That power supply is low noise, you know, super stable. That's gonna be a good product. So when you're choosing things, thinking about implementation. I am of the school of thought, except for in solid state, that there's no original ideas in audio. Most of it is implementation. How, how thoughtful that implementation is, how complete that implementation is, is the secret sauce, typically. Now that's, that's very true for my amplifiers, but I think that that's true if you look at other companies' uh, amplification too. You know, uh, this is effectively a linear power supply. This is a power transformer right here. There's the power supply right there. Okay. Um, so when you're trying to make choices, uh, I had a dealer. Uh, so there was a company at Deja Vu Audio South in San Diego. Uh, super nice guy. So if you've ever met Vu, uh, who owns Deja Vu, I think in Maryland, <laughs> super esoteric dealer, builds like Western electric horn loaded speakers, custom order. This is like not off the shelf. This is not off the, this is like off the menu where you get mailed the menu and you don't know what you're getting. <laughs> Super cool stuff. So I'm, doing, I'm talking to the owner of Deja Vu South and he's like, we don't carry this. And I'm like, why don't you carry this? It's a good product. And he said, if someone can't own a product for five years, I don't want them to buy it. And that normally means there's a higher cost of entry. But the whole point of it is that you don't want to be somebody who exchanges gear, I've done it. I don't know who else here has an addiction that they <laughs> bought gear and either sold, modified, gifted, 
bestowed to others in less than three months and bought more gear. Dude, you're at a headphone show. <laughs> I, I thought that's the requirement. Well, I, look, I will. So, if this is like an Al Anon meeting, I'll hold my hand up. I saw an amplifier that wasn't mine yesterday, and I bought it on a whim, having not even heard it because it was so cute. I bought the same amp. Right. I, 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 now, I'm a Mac, I love Macintosh audio. I use their pre in my two channel. I've owned a lot of Macintosh gear. All I own is their pre at this moment, other than the, the headphone amp. But I looked at it, and it was like, Chiquito! Oh, you're so cute! Oh. Okay, fine, I bought it. Literally, it's at home, sitting on my rack. My novel, my personal novelist came here for the second unit, and the, the, the Macintosh unit uh, went home with me because it was so cute. We all, but my hope, God, I, I tried to sell this to my wife last night. My hope is that I'm gonna keep it for a long time. <laughs> right? And my wife's like, all the arguments I gave, my wife was just like, well, it doesn't matter, Justin. That was sort of the answer. Be because she, she saw through that argument, unfortunately. But let's, let's, just, um, let, let's assume that I'm trying to teach you a different path. Buy the most expensive, coolest shit that you can, excuse my language if I offended anybody, um, so that you have a high degree of pride of ownership that you've thought about why you bought it. Like legitimately, like not just did it sound good, but did it represent your value set? You know, uh, did it need to be made in California? Did it need to be made in the U.S.? Did it have to have union la union labor? Does it use the connectors that made sense to you? Does it? Uh, don't buy something that you feel is disposable because if you don't value you, you won't keep it. And so this dealer's whole point was that telling somebody, "No, I'm not going to sell you this. Go back and save up," was to try to tell the person. I want you to own this longer. Probably also self-serving in the other part of it too, but I took it for the for the nice sentiment that he was trying to gain. All right, things to be thought about also, guys. Um, so gain increases voltage, drive increases current. So with tube amps, tube amps are really predominantly voltage specific devices. Works great for headphones, works really great for dynamic headphones. So if you think tube amps, you almost always want to think, in general, dynamics, dynamics, dynamics. However, big power things produce current too. Big things with big power that have big power supplies produce current. And so that that that's a a, a mitigating factor in that choice, right? But if you're thinking again like orthodynamic and a tube amp. Like uh, peanut butter and jelly, solid combination almost always. Um, okay, a circuit. Anybody, you know, people want to say, what's a circuit, Justin? Any path that electrons flow can be considered a circuit. So there's lots of really good books. Um, if it, so, my email is either Justin S Weber at, and it's on the card, or sales at. Either one will get me. Um, if you guys want, I can give you a book list of things you can get on Amazon and start reading. You know, there's like a beginner's guide to reading schematics. Cost you like 13 bucks. And if you bought like the CMOS amp is somewhere, oh right here, I'm sorry. You can actually trace this out and begin to understand the relationship between what does a resistor do, what does a capacitor do, how does it interface the op amp, right? Because this amp is really simple. Volume, which is a potentiometer, and so the amp has a fixed gain. Most amps actually have a fixed gain. So they the fixed multiplying factor. They attenuate the input to modulate the output. So they limit the input. Right, so your, your, your input from your DAC or from your digital audio player, let's say, is one volt out, right? This doesn't let this, this headphone amp see one volt all the time. It lets it see a logarithmic exponentially smaller version of that curve until you dial up the volume pump. So this amp is super simple and a great case example because you have in-out attenuation, right? And you have a really simple power supply, right? You have a capacitor and a energy bank, which is the, uh, which is the battery. So buying a book like The Beginner's Guide to, to Reading Schematics about 80 pages, and drawing it out will like in, blow your mind. It will inform you as to lots of different ideas. Um, if you're getting into then tube amps, you're like, well, I want to learn more about tube amps. 
everybody who everybody who's ever built a tube amp as a company bought a Dynaco, broke it, and fixed it. So there's a company called Dynaco. You can buy them on eBay. Um, they come broken almost always. Um, and a voltmeter. Yep. Harman Kardon, Macintosh, Fisher, Pilot, Dynaco. Um, um, a voltmeter, a soldering iron, and a reading schematic will fix it for you, and you'll have a, a working tube amp. It'll be super il illustrative. But anybody who started out with a Dynaco then bought themselves the RCA uh, tube receiving manual. <coughs> you can get it for $13 on, on eBay. I have like six copies. Uh, I don't know why, but I do. Um, but it's a, it, again, there's no original ideas in audio. I'm a plagiarist. I have used circuits from that book. Right? Most of us have. If you say that we have, like, our power supply is different. We've done changes. But the core circuit that RCA designed is a good one. One should try to go with good, you know, people that invest millions of dollars in R&D and then gave it to the public for free. We should go forth with that idea. Um, and most audio companies have done the same. And that there's nothing wrong with that. Again, implementation is, is the secret sauce. Okay, um, feedback. To feedback or not to feedback? That is the question. Um, how many people here, show of hands, can say that they know the difference between a uh, organic sounding amplifier or sound and something that is very uh, restrained or even? If you listen to two pieces of tracks, two different pieces of equipment, same track, two different pieces of equipment, could you hear the difference between one was more organic and one is more linear? Sure. Can you give me one word that would describe in the back, Mr. Stratton, a linear response? Okay. Why? Okay. So feedback homogenizes an output signal. Makes it all behave predictably. How much feedback depends on how homogenized it becomes. So if you looked at like a sine wave, right? So line in the middle, there's a rise and a drop, right? Feedback is like taking a line and taking the top of that wave and drawing it and clipping it off. And feedback is like taking the bottom of that wave, dropping it and clipping it off. You get more of the middle. And it all makes more sense. But it, it might not seem as real. Right? So amps, like some of my designs, most of my designs, that have no feedback are not even in their presentation, per se. So they're, they have warts. What doesn't when, when, when we look closely enough? But the question it becomes, does it, does it make more sense? Does it engage us more? Right? So if you've had like home cooking, uh, so here's a good culinary example. Everybody know what makes restaurant food so magical? Butter. Good, good start. <laughs> oh, salt. salt. So the, the, answer, the answer actually typically when you ask a chef is salt. <laughs> restaurant cooking is salt specific, right? So if you, ha if you have heart issues, you can't eat at restaurants. It's brutal in general because um, Everybody lies to you about how much salt goes into things, right? And then what makes good home cooking? It's not paying attention, but okay. Butter, <laughs> right? And then the answer goes, what makes really good food? Salt and butter. <laughs> <coughs> feedback has a point. Feedback can lower the noise floor of an amplifier. Feedback can extend the bandwidth of an amplifier. But feedback can have you lose the peaks and valleys that may give the magic to an amplifier as well. So how judiciously one chooses makes a difference. So again, if you're, a, if you're somebody who likes a lot of electronic music, electronic music um, is artificial. No offense, everybody. I like electronic music. I'm not knocking it. Um, I, I mean, I'm a connoisseur. I'm really not knocking it. But its production is not using instruments that can be played typically. An 808 synthesizer 
approximates the sound of a lot of instruments. It doesn't actually produce its own sound, right? It, it doesn't have a reed, it doesn't have strings, it, it doesn't produce its own sound. And so its characterological composition is really hard for analog devices, tube amps, things that don't have feedback, to produce accurately. So if you take something that's a, a Oh, sorry, did you have your hand up? No, I'm sorry. Okay. So if you take something that was sort of produced in a digital realm and try to have an analog reproduce it, there are flaws typically. And conversely, having something that's digital, so if you have an analog source, like something that was like most instrumental music or guitar music, right, and have something that's like solid state reproduce it, it doesn't always go as well either. So these are these sort of axioms of like how do we how do we pick what we want? Um, I walked into this one showroom, the, the company, the, the dealer has since closed, and they had these huge line array speakers with massive subs, and they were playing, uh, they, were, they were playing Daft Punk, um, the Tron album. And I walked in, I was like, oh, oh my, it's awesome. I mean, it was a room this big, and they were compressing the room. So the wall, you could feel the walls move, you know, the air was compressing on us because the, the woofers could generate that kind of motion, that much airflow, right? And the transients were lightning fast, but it, it couldn't do Frank Sinatra. It could do Daft Punk, but it couldn't do Frank Sinatra. And those same kind of limitations and considerations, there's no perfect answer. I can't tell you, pick this choice, throw money at it, and you're gonna get what you want. You know, you have to know what you want to listen to and pick the right choice, just like we do when we pick our cars or what we wear or what watches we own and why we own that watch. <coughs> okay, power output is the amount of current sourced into a given impedance. Um, we talked about voltage already. Uh, current is a stream, uh, so voltage is an electromotive force or potential uh, difference expressed in volts. So that's just power expressed in volts. Okay. Uh, current is a stream of charged particles. So there's this picture people like to show of like a, a hose, and then the water through the hose is the current, and the restrictor is the impedance. That's not the, you know, and what's left on the other side is the voltage. That's not a bad way to think about it. Um, you know, so again, right, current is the water through the hose, the diameter of the hose, um, and how short, or, or how, we all know how to like calculate volume and, and speed, right? We, we could look it up in a book and figure it out. But, or pressure as an example, so you can get more pressure in a smaller diameter hose, but you can't get more volume, right? Same sort of idea with electrons and their flow with current versus impedance, right, and resistance. So when you start reading it, and you just look at that, those same sort of analogies, it'll start to make more sense. Okay, uh, let's see, dampening factor. This is a good one, because this is a whole big argument, like dampening factor in the 1 8th rule, right? So there's this idea that you want your uh, output impedance to be 1 8th, uh, output impedance of your amplification device to be 1 8th, the reflected impedance of the voice coil of the headphone. So 1 8th of 300 ohms. <coughs> Right, gets us a perfect one eighth multiplier, and we're going to have really good dampening factor for our headphones. So why don't I do that? Why do I source? Um, why do my transformers come in multiple impedances that are the actual uh, reflected impedance of the voice coil? Why am I not following the one eighth rule? I believe the one eighth rule is principally there to protect solid state devices from going to short and blowing up. So it's a self-serving analogy. Also, triode amplifiers. <coughs> so this tube here is a 1951 tube, by the way. Super old, relatively inexpensive. It's called 6BG4, 6B4G. Um, triodes generally have really shitty, um, triodes especially with no feedback and, uh, let's see, no feedback, We'll go there. So triodes with no feedback 
have really poor dampening in general. So a dampening factor is a numeric number. The higher the number, the more uh, control of your driver. Just we can conceptualize that. So like if you had a solid state amp that was class A solid state amp, it might have a dampening factor between one and 1,000. It's got grip on your woofer. It will just, it, that woofer will not move unless that, unless uh, that amp wanted it to do so. The lower the number, the more willy-nilly freeform that woofer can be relative to the amplifier per se. Now a good speaker, good headphone, is already acoustically controlling that woofer's movement before amplification. So if you have like a, a PA speaker, it'll have a cone and then it has um, the, accord, the surround. So on the outside of the, of the cone of the woofer, there is a material, either rubber or pleated material that attaches it to the basket of the woofer, the, the mechanical connection between the driver and the cabinet, right? So that suspension is generally super stiff. It, that woofer doesn't move in, in, by nature without it having energy applied to it already. So why this question of dampening? Well, the more precise, the, the, the higher the dampening, the faster you can get the driver to move instantaneously. So the, the more higher that rise time question, right? Uh, the faster the attack, the faster the snap, the actual percussive uh, echo, the first reflection outward. Tryouts don't do that well, right? Tryouts have really, really low dampening. So why are we using it? Why aren't we following the 1-8th rule? If they have low, if, if I can't, no matter what I do for an impedance, I'm unlikely to generate a high enough dampening factor where it matters, right? Because I can't lower the impedance low enough, short of getting to DC, that I'm gonna increase the dampening factor by more than a few points. The difference in, in the driver's movement of a dampening factor of let's say three to six, which is what a triode amplifier typically would have, versus a solid state amplifier that'll have a dampening factor of 100, I can't get to 100. I can improve three or six to nine, I can't get to 100. So I'm not gonna hear the difference. But what I can do is I can make the voltage transfer between my transformer and the voice coil as minimally intrusive as possible. Sorry for a second. So if I make it as efficient as possible, all the juice I put into my amplifier can get to that voice coil without getting in the way. Because torque converters, though, um, cu can couple the sound and multiply the sound, there is energy that's lost in heat, right? You know, generally know that. The same idea with transformers. So if you can impedance match, you have less loss of energy, creating a more efficient circuit. And so it helps tube amps win while knowing their their weaknesses, per se. Okay, uh, distortion is any unwanted noise. Um, so here's the thing: distortion it, it, it is a given. The question is, uh, what type of distortion do you want? So, tube amps produce um, second order. Yes, let me get this back. Always get this goofed. Second order harmonics are that which we generally would find in nature. So our harmonic is a multiplier of the, of the original signal. So if you get a basics of amplification book, like 12 bucks on Amazon, they'll go through this much more robustly. But a harmonic is a multiplier of the original signal, right? Two amps generally produce second order harmonics. So we produce lower order harmonics. Lower order harmonics are what is produced in nature typically. Solid state amps generally produce at a greater rate higher order harmonics, which are discontinuous to our ear and make us wonder if it feels real. It can feel hyper real, but it doesn't feel real real. That makes sense. Um, okay, so that's some thoughts. Do you guys have one or two questions I could try to answer for you? Sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, what I would call two 
longevity anxiety. You see a lot of people always like wanting to change them after only like 20 hours of use and stuff. That is prolifically foolish. <laughs> so, a, 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 so a, 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 a tube, <coughs> a tube is like a candle or a bottle of wine. Once you crack it open, it's forever changing until it's gone. Um, and a tube has to get a certain amount of carbon buildup on, on its plate structure anyway to actually, like, it's got a breaking period, like break pads. And if you don't get to that, you're going to have some oddities of sound anyway. Now, a small pin tube, a nine pin tube, like uh, on the bottle head crack, the front tube would be called a nine pin tube. That has a lifespan of about 10,000 hours of use really a long time. The power tubes, like these here, have a lifespan of about 2,000 hours. Now, people who change tubes very quickly are looking for differences in sound very often. I don't think they're getting to enjoy their music at the highest, at, at, the, at the same level, because it's not being as transformative. They are still attending to an anchor point that they can inject uh, control into. Um, I like to tell people, use the amplifier, learn the sound, and then change. So, you know, if you've learned something, used it long enough, then when you change, you can see the subtle differences as well as the, the macro differences much quicker. You know, but 20 hours on a tube is like, 200 hours on a tube, it's broken in, it's not worn out. <coughs> it's just broken in. It's like an infant. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What about solid state tubes? Uh, specifically, I refer to the new cord tubes. And I have one I put yep. together that's in that Altoid case. So the, 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 the cord nanotube is a tube. And it probably. It's a distortion producing device, distortion producing amplification device. It's a tube. Is it a quirky ass design? I believe it is. I mean, it, it's super cool in that it's, it's like no bigger than your thumb. It looks like a piece of trident and it's a vacuum tube and you can solder it into things. I mean, I think that Astle and Kern even has some new devices that are coming out with vacuum tubes in solid state devices. You can put five Gs of energy into it and like, you know, drop it out of a, a MIG plane and the tube won't explode, won't damage the glass. There's super cool ideas, but it, 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 it certainly, I think, loses the romantic factor of like looking at the, the filaments as they glow. Well, it still glows. Green, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it actually glows. I mean, it, 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 it's just, it, it's a very different experience. You know, but it's also, I think like, so all tubes have a tube trace of how linear their response is. It's a tr tremendously linear tube. And I wonder, um, I've always appreciated that tubes have, each has their own personality, and so many of them are not linear, and that's okay. Um, making it, uh, getting closer and closer to the zero sum point doesn't always answer the question for me. But yeah, no, it's still a vacuum tube. Any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Of course. <coughs> um, I'm just curious, um, like as a uh, amplifier designer or engineer, what's your methodology for choosing your next amplifier? Sure. So I will own something and and um, and uh, eat humble pie today. <laughs> Uh, I did not want to build another 300 BM. My first attempt was less good, had a less good outcome. Um, and my desire to build one was because the market has told me that I need to do this. It's not of my own choosing. Uh, because the Rockwell, this is the Rockwell, it, it's a very, very, very similar circuit. And the Rockwell lets me buy old tubes, really old tubes, at an affordable price for the 300 BM, uh, you know, old 300B tubes are like $10,000 each. I just blows my mind, can't do it. But I listened to what the market told me and I 
redoubled my efforts and we have a better amp. And the truth that really swayed me is that in the last three years, uh, two manufacturers that still exist have gone about making really high quality 300 Bs. And so because they're high quality, reasonably affordable options, I was willing to, to go into it again. But you know, I, I tend to be a high value person and I appreciate what we call slow technology. Um, and so it was a hard sell for me. But truthfully, my 300B, 300B version of the exact same amp sounds better than the old tube version of the same amp. I was wrong. I apologize. <laughs> Do we want to do some raffling? I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I, I cut this short. We're already way over. Sure, time. I'm sorry. Um, I does anyone not have uh, a raffle card? Thank you. Keep them up till I get to you. Mm -hmm. Mm So 13 is not here right now, but here's what I, we need from you. Your personal information, you'll have, hand it to Warren, because Bottlehead, uh, in their incredible generosity, has extended a Bottlehead crack to you, and it will ship in October. You gotta build it though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but a Bottlehead crack is wrong. Thank you guys. Uh, if you guys have any more questions for Justin, he'll be at the TSA. <laughs> <laughs>